Welcome to our online service and welcome to Journey Church. We are a group of imperfect people who just want to be like Jesus. Our motto is all about loving God and loving people. So I hope today you'll enjoy this video. I pray that you worship along with us and I pray that it's meaningful to you and that you would share it with others. Let's get that awesome Journey Band in here.
Yeah.
So I just moved to a new high school and was trying to make friends and I happened to just meet this really awesome girl and we clicked right away. Someone came up to me and was um, gave me just some information about my friends uh, and her family that I just didn't think were true and um, I kind of just thought it was just really um, awful to say. Um, so I brought this up to my best friend. I wanted her to know and I wanted you know, her family to know that someone was saying something about them. The family said that I was making it completely up. They assumed that I was the one that was saying stuff and that it was my fault um, and that I was lying. At the end of it, our relationship hasn't been the same and so it really just hurt me and it made me feel like I was rejected from not only a friendship but from a family. Based on that situation that happened, it kind of made me not want to get close to anyone because I always kind of thought that I was the problem or that I would just be misunderstood again in the situation. And so I just didn't want that to happen. Pretty much every relationship after that, I kind of just walked into it walking on eggshells. I didn't want to really offend anyone or let people down or to be judged um, based on something that I was saying. I can remember one time being invited to um, one of my friend's birthday parties and I was like, okay, well, who's gonna be there? Do I know these people? And she was just like, just come. Whereas I used to just jump towards those things, I was very scared and standoffish. And I completely backed out because when I looked at the friends list or the invite list, I didn't know anyone there. And I just became really overwhelmed with like, just the fact that I would have to go into a new space and um, either put on this fake me or um, just have to go through that same process over again. So it really re affected my relationship with the Lord. I wasn't really able to go deep um, like I wanted to, um, just a fear of not being enough, of not being received well, or um, just being condemned, honestly, and not um, being accepted by Him. And although I could like read, you know, in the Word where it says that and could feel it and sense it, um, for some reason I just couldn't get past um, just that wall or barrier of not being surface level with him. I really wanted intimacy, but I just couldn't get it. I think when I started going to uh, Gateway, like just having a mentor um, to kind of walk alongside me and some of those things and really to kind of highlight some of the things that she saw in my life. And going through that, I really was able to like dig deep and see some of those issues and uh, kind of get to the root of what was going on and why I was so like nervous around people or um, why I didn't let people come into my life. After that, I kind of was just really open about it with most of my friends. And so um, my two best friends pretty much, like if I, I would have to tell them about like where I was getting invited to and they'd be like, okay, so you're gonna go to that and you're gonna go and you're gonna be okay. And they just really encouraged me um, and in prayer and um, just in my quiet time with the Lord, he really just gave me the confidence that I needed and just the reassurance that um, I am accepted in him. And so um, it's just been really great. And it's obviously an ongoing process. No, I can't take one more step towards you Cause all that's waiting is regret And don't you know I'm not your ghost anymore You lost the love I loved the most I learned to live And who do you think you are? Running around leaving scars Collecting your jar of hearts And tearing love apart You're gonna catch a cold From the ice inside your soul So don't come back for me Who do you think you are? I hear you're asking all around If I am anywhere to be found But I have grown too strong To ever fall back in your
And who do you think you are? Running around leaving scars Collecting your jar of hearts And tearing love apart You're gonna catch a cold From the ice inside your soul So don't come back for me Who do you think you are? And it took so long just to feel alright Remember how to put back the light in my eyes I wish I had missed the first time that we kissed Cause you broke all your promises And now you're back You don't get to get me back And who do you think you are? Running around leaving scars Collecting your jar of hearts And tearing love apart You're gonna catch a cold From the ice inside your soul So don't come back for me Don't come back at all And who do you think you are? Running around leaving scars Collecting your jar of hearts And tearing love apart You're gonna catch a cold From the ice inside your soul Don't come back for me Don't come back at all Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? We want our lives to be in control, but where do we turn when they're not? When the storms hit us out of nowhere, what happens then? We can hide the weight of our worries behind the smiles on our faces. We can try our best to mask the hurt and to cover over the pain. But in our private and alone moments, we're praying with tears and we're longing in desperation for something to change. So in moments like these, we need to be reminded of something that we probably already know. That if you're in Christ, it's all going to be okay. As the waves rise and as the earth crumbles all around, as the regrets mount and as the uncertainty refuses to give way, if you're in Christ, it's all going to be okay. This has nothing to do with positivity or wishful thinking. Rather, it's because we have this hope as an anchor for our souls. That if Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on the third day, and if the power of God was behind it all, then truly beloved, there can be no greater truth than this. If you are in Christ, if you are in Christ Jesus, whether you see it fulfilled in this life or the next, it's all going to be okay. Hi, I have a question for you. What's your favorite movie genre? What type of movie do you like the most? Do you think action movies are best? Top Gun, Die Hard, Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible, James Bond? Or are you going to go with comedies, Dumb and Dumber, Trading Places, Young Frankenstein, Blazing Saddles, Coming to America? Are you really into superhero movies, Spider-Man, Iron Man, The Avengers, Batman, Wonder Woman? Do you enjoy dramas or thrillers, Oppenheimer, The Shawshank Redemption, The Hunger Games, The Lord of the Rings? Hmm. What am I forgetting? Oh yeah, rom-coms. Pretty Woman, Hitch, When Harry Met Sally, 
The Princess Bride. We're starting today a new series called Relationship Reset. And the book of the Bible we're going to focus on, if it were a movie, might be considered a chick flick. There are a couple of women who are the lead characters. And there's a lot of talking. Craig Groeschel, from whom I've learned a lot that will be included in this series, says that of the 85 verses in this book of the Bible, 55 of them are dialogue. There aren't any car chases or explosions in this story. So you may be tempted to think you should just change the channel of your attention because there's not going to be anything in this series for you. But it's an amazing and powerful story. It's the Old Testament book of Ruth. There's tragedy. There's loss and grief. There's heartbreak and desperation. There's loneliness and isolation. There's perseverance and determination. There's love and devotion. There's joy, celebration, and hope. If you've experienced any of these, and you know you have, then you won't want to miss out on any of the talks in this series. In the story of Ruth, God is very, very present, but not in the way you might expect. There aren't any physical miracles. There's no parting of the sea or walking on water. There's no healing of the sick or rising from the dead. But in the story of Ruth, we find the presence and providence of a loving, good God can continually be experienced in our uncertain and broken world. In this Relationship Reset series, which is grounded in the story of Ruth, we'll find a life-changing message that speaks to anyone, anyone who is hurting, who is discouraged, who is losing hope, who is questioning if God cares and if God has something better for them, who is stuck in a place they shouldn't be. This series is for you if you want to know comfort in your troubles, if you want to discover strength when you struggle to carry on, if you want a deep and abiding faith in God, even in and especially when you go through tough times. In this series, you'll discover that because the providence of God is continually active in the world, like was said in the video, even when the storms of life hit us out of nowhere, we can have the assurance that if you're in Christ, it's all going to be okay. Are you ready? Let's dive in. The storyline of the book of Ruth begins this way. Before Israel was ruled by kings, Elimelech from the clan of Ephrath lived in the town of Bethlehem. His wife was named Naomi, and their two sons were Malon and Kilian. But when their crops failed in Israel, they moved to the country of Moab. And while they were there, Elimelech died, leaving Naomi with only her two sons. Later, Naomi's sons married Moabite women. One was named Orpah and the other Ruth. About ten years later, Malon and Kilian also died. Now Naomi had no husband or sons. If you were to check out a printed or online Bible you'd find that in the very last verse in the book of Judges, which is just before the book of Ruth, it says that when Israel had no king, everyone did what in his own opinion he thought to be right. That's the context of the story of Ruth. And that's the context of our story today, isn't it? Everyone does what in their own opinion they think is right. Can I get an amen? Everyone does what pleases them. No one can tell them what's right or wrong. Let's identify the characters so far in this Old Testament story. There was a husband named Elimelech 
whose name meant, My God is King, and a wife named Naomi, whose name meant sweet or pleasant. And their two sons, named Malon and Kilion, whose names meant, I'm not joking, sick and tired. Now you parents, how many of you think that you should have named your kids sick and tired because you're sick and tired of them? Don't any of you dare raise your hands on that. Names at that time were often thought of as being prophetic of a child's future. So it may be assumed that both of these sons had poor health when they were babies. My parents named me Michael Rolfe. I'm not sure that they knew the meaning of these names. Michael means one who is like God or who is a gift of God. So yeah, I like that they named me that. Rolf means famed wolf. I'm not so sure how I feel about them naming me that, especially since they could not come up with a middle name for me until they just randomly pointed to a name in the phone book, and that's what they decided to call me. And when I was a teenager, it might just have been possible that there were some girls whom I dated that thought that a name meaning famed wolf accurately described me, but let's not go there, okay? Because in terms of a relationship reset, they would have decided to just have walked away from the relationship. Elimelech and Naomi and their sons lived in Bethlehem in a time when a famine descended. What does Elimelech decide to do? He decides to do what he thinks is right. He decides to move his family to Moab, which would have been a journey of a couple days, uh, about 50 miles. Elimelech decided to do what was right in his own opinion, but he didn't consider what God wanted and what God said was right. Does that sound like any of us? Have any of us done that? We've made decisions based only on our own opinions and what we thought was right without considering God in the equation at all. And what was the consequence of that for us? For Elimelech, it was a terrible choice that brought destructive consequences. Why? If you check out 2 Kings 3.27, you find that the king of Moab offered his firstborn son as a burnt offering to Moab's false god Chemosh. In Moab, child sacrifice was practiced. God's people left that place. They walked away from it. They returned back to Israel. The people of Moab were enemies of the people of Israel because they worshiped false gods sacrificing their children by burning them. Elimelech decided to lead his family from Bethlehem to a place of idolatry and immense evil. He wasn't living like God was his king, like his name meant. He was doing the opposite of what God as the king of his life wanted. Put yourself in Elimelech's place. He was struggling economically to feed his family. So he made the decision to go where he thought it would be a better place economically. How many of us might think about doing the same? But if we're tempted to make decisions that are based solely on economic interests and that lead us away from God, we're to walk away from that option because that's not the right place for us. Instead, we're to seek where God is leading us. Have you ever moved to a new place to take a new job, and you found that it led you away from God? You got caught up in what you thought was the good life, but the end result was destructive. Maybe for you, it wasn't a new job, but it was going away to college. 
and you sowed your wild oats and you suffered a crop failure as you lived in a way that according to your own opinion was right, but you too left God out of the equation. When it comes to living a godly life, don't prioritize economic prosperity or personal selfishness over the presence of God. If you take a job or make any other decision solely because, in your opinion, it will benefit you, but it results in you not being meaningfully plugged into genuine Christian community because you surround yourself with people who are far from God and you do it just for a little more money, it's ultimately going to be a bad deal for you. If, in your opinion, it's perfectly fine for you to have sex outside of the covenant of marriage because you've gone to a place in your thinking that there's nothing wrong with it because you say to yourself, everyone is doing it and you've surrounded yourself with people who think that way, it's ultimately going to be a bad deal for you. If, in your opinion, it's perfectly fine for you to spend what you consider to be your money in any way you selfishly choose, and you don't really care that it's God's will for you to give faithfully and sacrificially to the body of Christ, the church, because it's all God's money anyway, you're ultimately going to find that's a bad deal as you experience the consequences of your selfishness. If, in your opinion, there's nothing wrong with getting drunk or taking illegal drugs or gambling or any self-destructive behavior because that's what the people you surround yourself with, either in person or, or online, believe. It's ultimately going to be a bad deal for you. It's going to be a bad deal for you to do anything in which you try to live your own truth instead of God's truth. You need instead to walk away from the temptation to go along with people you're in relationships with who are leading you to live in ways opposed to God's will. Elimelech, who led his family to move to a God-rejecting or God-ignoring place, died in that place. His and Naomi's two sons married two Moabite women who did not worship the one true God. 2 Corinthians 6.14 offers a warning about marrying persons who do not believe in the Lord. God doesn't want relationships like that for believers. It says, You are not the same as those who do not believe. So do not join yourselves to them. Good and bad do not belong together. Light and darkness cannot share together. Now you may question, why is God so restrictive? He's a hunk. She's a knockout. In my opinion, that's what really counts. Why is God trying to spoil things? God is not. God is actually being loving by setting limits for us because God knows what's truly good for us even when we fail to see that. If God is really the king of our lives, we'll want what God wants for us because that's best. Malon and Killian, or sick and tired, chose to marry women who did not believe in God and like their dad, they die. Now, Imagine the heartbreak, the grief, the sense of isolation, the sense of desperation Naomi must have experienced in that place. So what does Naomi decide to do? She decides to walk away from that unbelieving place because of the anguish and heartbreak that has come to her and return back home to Bethlehem and God's people. Is that similar to what some of us need to do as well? To walk away 
from situations, environments, relationships that are leading to hurt and pain and grief and upset. Naomi decides to leave Moab behind. And in this chick flick-like story, she and her two daughters-in-law, all of them widows, with no homes, no money, no hope, prepare to leave the place they'd been and to journey to Bethlehem. Like lots of chick flicks, there's weeping and crying as Naomi and Orpah and Ruth have a tear-filled conversation. Now, you may be interested to know that Oprah Winfrey's mother intended to name her Orpah, but the name was written down incorrectly on her birth certificate, and she ended up being called Oprah. Naomi says to Orpah, not Oprah, and to Ruth that they should go back to their mother's houses. Well, there was more weeping and crying. Yeah, a chick flick. Eventually, Orpah says goodbye to Naomi. But Ruth doesn't. Ruth speaks for the first time. Ruth answered, Please don't tell me to leave you and return home. I will go where you go. I will live where you live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Now, you may have assumed when you've heard this Bible verse read at weddings, it was originally said between a husband and a wife. But no, it was between a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law. Ruth declared her fierce loyalty to her relationship with Naomi. But notice, it's not just a declaration of faithfulness to a person. Even more importantly, it's a declaration of faith in relationship to God. Your God will be my God. Ruth walked away from the idolatry in the place she'd been. She walked away from the worship of the false god Chamos, to whom children were sacrificed. She walked away from her former life and self-destructive ways and relationships, and she did a reset. This is a picture of what the Bible calls in the New Testament repentance. Repentance means to turn away from the sin in your life, to leave behind the selfish life you've been living, and to dedicate your life completely to God. When it comes to a relationship reset, you need to leave behind the wrong place to get to the right place. Say that with me. You need to leave behind the wrong place to get to the right place. You need to walk away from those things that are separating you from God. You need to walk away from anything that's not God's will. If you're in a toxic work situation that's leading you away from the Lord, you need to walk away from the wrong place if you're going to get to the right place. If you're in a friendship that's leading you away from the Lord, you need to walk away from the wrong relationship if you're going to get to the right relationship. If you're dating someone that's leading you away from the Lord, you need to walk away from the wrong relationship if you're going to get to the right relationship. Ruth made the decision to repent, to turn away from her wrong choices in the past, to leave behind the place she'd been, and to embrace a faith in the Lord that changed her life and her legacy. She left the wrong place, Moab, to get to the right place, the place God wanted her to be, Bethlehem. And what happened there? Yep, the Savior of the world, Jesus, was born in Bethlehem. And who was the ancestor of Jesus? Yep, Ruth. How's that for a plot twist in a chick flick? So, 
Where are you right now? Are you in the place God wants you to be? Or are you in a place that God doesn't want you to be? Do you need to reset a relationship you're in with another person that's unhealthy, damaging, destructive, but you've not been willing to walk away from it? Is today the day you're going to do that? Do you need a reset in your relationship with God? Do you need to let go of where you've been and turn and come home to the Lord? Is today the day you're going to do that? One decision by Ruth changed the direction of her life. What decision is God calling you to make that will change your life? What's it going to take for you to leave behind the self-sabotage that's been taking place in your life? What selfishness or false idol do you need to walk away from? What relationship do you need to reset if you're truly going to live a life of faithfulness and fierce loyalty to the Lord? You can decide to return to God. You can take action to repent, to be reborn, to have your life rebuilt, to reap the rewards of godly relationships and of being reconciled to God. It's your decision. What's it going to be? Let's pray together. Loving Lord who cares for us more than we can comprehend, We live in a broken world, a world in which there's such selfishness and sinfulness. And God, we may be tempted to point out the wrongs in other people's lives, but first we need to do a self-examination to see where we're contributing to broken relationships, to seriously consider how selfishness and disobedience is leading us away from you. And then we get caught up in cycles of relationships that are hurtful and harmful, and we contribute to them. Lord, help us to realize that like Ruth, we're to make the decision to walk away from anything that separates us from you. We're to walk away from sin and selfishness. We're to walk away from greed We're to walk away from mean-spiritedness. We're to walk away from relationships that are damaging to us. Help us to realize, God, that you want us to return home to you, to the life you intend for us, the very best life possible. And may we receive from you the courage and the faithfulness to move into the new future you have for us. We pray this in the strength of Jesus. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not
We're genuinely glad that you're a part of this online service of Journey Church. We hope you found it meaningful. And if you'd like to learn more about how is it that you become a follower of Jesus, if you'd like to connect in meaningful relationships with one of our small groups, either in person or online, if you want us to pray for you, to encourage you in some way, if you have questions about faith, we invite you to go to journeyconnection.com, click on the eConnect card, let us know. We'll be in contact with you. And if you know that you have been blessed by God, that God has led you away from place of self-destruction and self-sabotage, and God has given to you a, a new purpose and a new hope, I, I trust you'll want to be generous to show your love for Jesus. And I invite you to go to our website, journeyconnection.com, and to contribute financially because when you do that, you make our online services possible and you make possible our in-person ministries. And when you give, yes, you make a difference in the lives of children and youth. You help feed the hungry and care for the poor. But you also allow us to partner with some community organizations, one of which is called Roanoke Area Ministries. And when you give to Journey, a portion goes to them to help needy families in our community. So thank you, if you're a Jesus follower, for being generous as the Lord wants you to be. And we hope you'll be with us again next week as we continue in our series, Relationship Reset. God bless you.